this over with. That is how we started the last time I did a video like this, where I reviewed the worst rated horror movie on IMDb. But as you can see from the title, that's not what we're doing today. We are reviewing the worst rated horror movie on Rotten Tomatoes, which, fun fact, was the one that I wanted to do originally. And then I found the movie that shall not be named from IMDb. Here we are, a year later, and it's finally time. Oh, my makeup looks like it's like crusting right off my face. I've been sculpting nonstop for the last two or three days, three days, two days. What is time? Time is a concept. Straight. My makeup looks exactly as I would expect after two days of doing this and just... <sighs> Peter's here. Yo, the <laughs> Peter's here. Zombies. <laughs> because this is a look in which I'm not going to be able to see and I needed someone's help to film this one for sure. Don't worry, he's been quarantined for the last four months to prepare for this day. Sure. Are you okay? Yeah. Are you isolated? It's fine. We already tested this in other videos. It's fine. It oh, doesn't. Really? Yeah. You haven't been here in a while, Peter, uh, but we run a tight ship here. Me, myself, and I. I figured out lots of things without you. You haven't said hello zombies for... <gasps> oh. Hello, zombies. If you're new here, my name is Mikey, but spelled bunny, M-Y-K-I-E. And here, I do gross things, cute things, sometimes a mix of both. We're getting off topic. What you're all wondering is, what is the worst rated horror movie on Rotten Tomatoes, you ask? Well, it is One Mist. Peter Hello. It's coming from inside the house. But it's not sponsored by One Mist Call. No, no, they would not do that. But it is sponsored by the next most appropriate thing possible, Case Defy. Let me tell you about them. <laughs> case Defy, the phone case brand that has gotten me to stare at the back of my phone more than I stare at the front. I seriously flip and play with my phone nonstop when it's in these cases. They're like my modern day stress ball. And that's just the start because Case Defy has thousands of super cute designs to pick from, or you can fully customize them with your favorite fonts, colors, designs, etc. See, this one has my name on it. This one reminds me of Rippy. This one glows in the dark. This one looks crazy under UV light. They don't even advertise this one as glow in the dark, but I swear it gets like supercharged by the sun and that looks so cool. But for someone like me, a cute case is not enough because I am constantly dropping my phone. No, like really, I've broken a lot of phones in my day. It's kind of a problem. But not with Case Defy's cases, because not only are they super stylish, their military grade protection makes them drop test approved for up to 6.6 .6 feet. And despite that, their cases still have a super slim profile at just 13 millimeters thick. It's basically the perfect case for the person who doesn't want to sacrifice style, customization, protection, or their super charming personality trait of being uncontrollably clumsy. Go to casetify.com slash Mikey today to get 20% off and match with me. Where to begin with this disaster of a film? It was made in 2008. It is a PG-13 horror movie. First mistake. It has a runtime of 87 whole minutes. Wow, wow, wow. The ginger is not playing around today. I feel so exposed. Oh, I wanted to know the budget. I think it was like $20 million. Or All right, like Peter, can you just look it up? Stop trying yeah, to act yeah, like I'm a like freaking cinephile. I'm trying to show off. $20 million. Oh, shut up! <laughs> you looked that up like an hour ago. How do you just know that offhand, you weirdo? Can you tell me the box office off the top of your head? Uh, it should be zero, but let's see. I'll guess 46 million. Is it really? Uh, it's 45.8. <laughs> okay, as I was saying, made for 20 million, box office 45? 45.8. So 46 million, okay. It is a remake of a Japanese horror film that apparently wasn't great to begin with. According to critics on Rotten Tomatoes, do not at me. The log line on the posters is, what will it sound like when you die? And I'm pretty sure the answer is the beginning of this movie. And it has a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. It has the second highest amount of negative reviews on the site. Not just in horror, H horror, the horror. I'm gonna say hara from now on. It's easier for my Philly mouth. With 80 critics weighing in, however, the audience score is a 29%, much more positive reviews there. The way Rotten Tomatoes works is that you basically decide if it's worth seeing or not. A tomato is it's worth seeing, and a Rotten Tomato is it's not worth seeing. All 80 critics who have weighed in on this film have said it is not worth seeing. <laughs> 
There are a lot of movies on Rotten Tomatoes that actually have 100%, which doesn't mean it's a perfect film, but it means that everyone who's watched it says, you should absolutely see this. And likewise, there are some zeros. Not many though. <laughs> and this one is apparently just the worst of the worst. It's notorious for being horrific. And one more thing, my qualifications for reviewing a horror movie are that I have a film degree and I am a person with an opinion. Therefore, I am qualified. And a reminder, this is just my opinion. The beauty of film is that it is interpreted in all different kinds of ways for every different kind of person, and you might love this film. I'm gonna be honest, I didn't hate it. Well, that's not true. <laughs> I went in expecting something like the lowest rated horror movie on IMDb. And compared to that one, which again, we're not gonna name anymore, this is an actual masterpiece. I'm just gonna say that right off the bat. I don't think it's painful to watch. I think there's a kind of person that would really enjoy this film, and I'll get there. But for starters, it's looking way better already. Is it bad? Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, don't, it's, it's bad. But it's not the worst. It's just the worst on Rotten Tomatoes. It has redeeming qualities. It does have redeeming qualities. I actually am excited because it's going to be more of like a real movie discussion, whereas the last one's just like bleach your eyes and maybe don't ever, just don't, just don't. The other one wasn't a film. It's a camera was on. A camera was on. One of my favorite quotes from the Rotten Tomato reviews. There's two I want to read. Quote, way too boring to even poke fun at. And then... Quote, another demonstration of how certain studios and producers care neither about us nor the skill required to pull off a respectable work of garbage. My review is not going to be that scathing. And obviously, spoilers ahead. It's so predictable, though, that the movie kind of spoils itself as you start watching it. That's one of the problems of the film. It's so predictable that somehow the main characters can't even predict their own death, even though they've heard it a day ago. All right, anyway. I'm doing this lady from the film. I think she's really creep, creep. It's gonna say creepy, and then cute, and then I said creep. All right. I think she's really creepy, but also a little cute. She's also the poster child for this movie. Literally, she's on the poster, and she has a child, so that kind of works. I've already made these guys. Check them out. Cool. And I made them with scar wax. And I had fun doing it. But I tried something new by sculpting them off of my face. Because I feel like it's too hard to work with on a moving face. And I thought, what if I could do it on my life cast? And I did. And I will put some footage of me making it somewhere in this video. But you're going to watch me paste it on my face. This is going to be fun. I don't know how this is going to work out. I've never used a scar wax prosthetic before. Ow. That kind of hurt. Don't do that. I'm using water activated paints to paint the insides of my eyes black because when all is said and done, I'm just gonna close my eyes to sell the illusion, sell the fantasy. The premise of the movie is that you get a voicemail on your phone. You don't get to like pick up and hear this in real time. It's always a voicemail where you hear your own death. The voicemail is dated in the future at the time and day that you die. You hear yourself say your last words and then you hear your death. Sometimes you even see your death via very, very pixelated the video phone circa 2008. That's the entire premise. And it's like viral. It passes on from everyone that's in the phone of the last person who got killed, and then it spreads to everyone in their contacts. Arbitrarily, but we'll get there. I have thoughts about the premise already, but let's start from the beginning. So right away, it starts off with a series of diegetic jump scares. Diegetic means it exists in the actual world of the film, such as like a door slamming, as opposed to a musical sting. So already, I'm super happy, because if you remember what I said about the worst rated horror movie on IMDb, I tend to not like musical stings in horror movies as is, because I don't think you should have to tell the audience when to jump with loud noises. This is already off to a great start. But then three minutes in, it had one of those cheap jump scares, so. <laughs> See, the thing is like, I'm just comparing it to the other worst rated film from IMDb. And with that frame of reference, with that perspective, it's really not that bad. That's kind of the thing about movies though, in a lot of ways. You know what? The Village is a perfect example and maybe it's one that I'll review on my channel someday. I feel like people went in thinking it was going to be the next Sixth Sense, the next Unbreakable, the scariest horror movie ever because it's marketed that way. So people's expectations were drastically different than I think the people marketing it should have gone for. I think it is best viewed going into it as a love story this side of creepy. It's really not a horror movie. It's not even listed as a horror movie. I think it's just listed as drama, which seems a lot more appropriate. So I think that if someone tells you that their favorite movie is the most amazing movie in the world, and then you finally see it, if there's anything that you can critique, 
You get defensive about the expectation you go in with almost. I think a lot of us do anyway. When I went into the worst rated horror movie on IMDb, I'm just gonna start calling it IMDb, by the way. It's too much of a mouthful. That's what she said. When I went into that, I had the opposite effect in that case because that was truly as bad as it gets. It really, it truly, it just is. But this one, I'm like, okay, I'm thinking it's gonna be on par because this is just a different site. But it's different because nothing is going to get onto Rotten Tomatoes without it being better because critics are going to be reviewing studio movies. The IMDb one is not a studio movie by any means, and this is produced by a massive studio, Warner Brothers, that also made things like Pan's Labyrinth, which is amazing. It also has a $20 million budget. I don't know what the other one's budget was, but I know it's probably like 0.5% of that. So things like that really help. Right off the bat, the shot quality and the production value is way better. It's not an ugly movie. There's actually quite a few shots in the movie where I was thinking like, that's a really pretty shot. The people that are doing lighting and electric and grip, the cinematographers, everyone's doing their job. Actually, the makeup is good too. There's a few practical effects and there's some over-reliance on CGI, but some of the CGI is not that bad. Some, some, some. The CGI is extra poor for like the final boss of the movie and it reminds me of how Game of Thrones had some terrible CGI in the final season when it's like, what are you doing? It's your final season and your Game of Thrones. Why would you not bring the best potential CGI to the most important part of the content? You feel me, Game of Thrones lover? I unfortunately do feel you. I watched this with Anthony and he fell asleep 30 minutes into it which I'm not gonna say is a reflection of the movie because honestly that's just typical Anthony <laughs> but before he passed out I wrote down some of his reactions I don't think he knows that I did, I did not <laughs> His reaction to the opening credits were, and I quote, this looks like B-roll for the Discovery Channel. And then, whoa, that was a sick animated sequence for no reason. So he is both one over and not impressed. Another one of the things that I noticed early on is that there is a lot of exposition in this film and the dialogue. It's very unnatural dialogue. It's not the way that people speak normally. And by exposition, I mean, it's very explanatory. For example, one of the first death voicemails that we hear, the person whose own death she just heard goes, hmm, this is marked Monday and her friend goes, hmm, it's Friday. It's just, it's very, what's the word, Peter? Bad. <laughs> it's not the best, that's for sure. I mean, it gets the job done, but you don't want to do that. If you guys are writing movies over there, don't do that. Sometimes it's really hard to do films without some kind of exposition because it's very hard to show certain things, but that's not one of them. And there are more clever ways to do it. I think a very good example of very clever exposition is Inception. Basically the first half of the film is exposition, but it's done in a way where it brings you into it and it doesn't just speak at you and tell you how things are gonna be. You know what I mean? This film has strange editing in a few different places where it doesn't match the action from the end of one shot to the next shot, especially for a film with this big of a budget, you would expect the editing to be a lot more smooth. That's not always the editor's fault. In fact, a lot of times it's probably just that they don't have the coverage that they need to make it fit seamlessly. It's a mess. The first death is a mess. She gets flung in front of a train. Her arm gets severed. And after death, post-mortem, her detached severed hand is dialing numbers from its phone. It's ridiculous. And then it follows up with a scene where the EMT is performing an autopsy in public by digging through this person's mouth and fishing out a very important piece to the story, a red hard candy. Peter thought it was a marble. It's a hard candy. I thought it was a marble too until they literally say in the script it's a hard candy because, you know, we do need them to explain some things because they're just not otherwise explained. The look that I'm recreating, by the way, is fully CGI in the movie, so I don't want to hear shit. If it looks a little funky, I did the best I could. This one's a little lumpier because I used a different technique on my life cast and I was kind of experimenting with this one. This one was... The bingo. If you'd like to see where my character is in the movie, it is exactly 16 minutes in. She's brief, but she's real cute. We don't know what she means. She's got a little bit of a recurring theme in the form of an action figure. Oh, we're not even gonna go there. We don't have time to even get into that shit. I think you're having so much trouble because good movies are supposed to be able to be explained in one sentence. And this movie is so disjointed that there's no way to describe what's going on in one sentence. There's definitely like a one sentence explanation. It's just that in order to explain the plot, you have to try to make sense of it more than the actual movie. The log line is several people start receiving voicemails from their future selves. <laughs> messages which include the date, time, and some of the details of their death. That's a terrible log line too. Oh my god. Also, that's the problem with the movie though, is that they literally get every bit of information to avoid their death and somehow don't. 
that's easily one of my biggest critiques is like, it begs a lot of questions, right? Do the people in this film have free will? Is it that once it is like sealed in fate via voicemail, you can't change it even if you're aware? Like, are you not able to literally stop saying the rest of the sentence? You know the exact date and time it's gonna happen. Why not hold yourself up somewhere where you're not gonna be interacting with anybody? Or is it that you'd end up saying that sentence no matter what, no matter where you are? If that's true, does that mean you physically can't stop yourself from saying it? Do you not have free will in this place? You definitely have thought about it more than they did. <laughs> My mouths are a little lopsided, but I glued this one too low and there's nothing I can do about it. Deal with it. Another big problem with this film is 35 minutes into it, I realize we know basically nothing about the main character. We know the tiniest bit about her and it's very like on the surface type things that felt like they were written into a beginning scene just for the sake of saying, we know that she's a college student. I don't even know her name at this point. We don't know anything about her personal life, which I feel like the writers can maybe argue is part of the point because we find out later that her dad is dead and that her mother was abusive. But you can be estranged from your family and still have a lot of other personality traits, obviously. And we don't spend any time getting to know anything about her we actually start to learn more about her friends in the movie than her herself. It doesn't seem like a choice, it seems like a mistake. Also, the rules of the whole haunted possessed phone thing are not explained, which I feel like is pretty important in a story where you have such a supernatural plot line. You kind of need some consistency to know how this works. For example, they make it seem like anyone who is in the phone of the recently deceased person then dials everyone in their phone and now they're getting voicemails of their deaths. But that's not true because early on we know that the train death, where we see the severed arm dialing, we know that that girl had our main character. What is our main character's name? Beth, it's Beth. I learned it at the very end of the movie, after I Googled it. <laughs> they do say her name in the movie. They just spend no real time on her. And so it's just forgettable. I'm trying to figure out how I want to blend this because obviously the edges are rough. I think there's only one thing that's gonna work. And unfortunately that's more scar wax. Truly terrifying. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've been complaining quite a lot in a row. So let me say something nice. I do think that there's a lot of characters in the film that are actually like pretty creepy to look at. I'm gonna credit that mostly to Japanese horror and not this movie specifically because I know that it, it's basically just ripping off a lot of Japanese horror classics type inspiration. It's a remake. But I do think that I would have enjoyed a movie like this when I was like 13. I think some of the imagery would have really freaked me out. And I think that this is a perfect movie for teenagers who want to sit in the back row of a theater and make out and pay attention to the movie every five minutes or so. You'll know just as much about the plot. As we do. No, honestly, it's true. It really does feel like it's written for viewers that they know will not be paying attention because that brings me back to my next criticism, which is that they over explain what they're literally showing us or just showed us a scene ago. It is written with the assumption that the audience is dumb, which I feel like is always a bad move. For example, they show footage from a nanny cam and then a character straight up goes, must be one of those nanny cams to keep an eye on the children. <laughs> when he first said that it was a nanny cam, I was like, oh, come on, overkill, we get it. And then and when he said to keep an eye on the children, I was like, wow, they just, they felt the need to explain what a nanny cam is. This is written for 13 year olds. No offense if you're 13, but like someone spent $20 million for you to be able to enjoy this movie. Let me take a little break from trashing this film to explain how I made scar wax prosthetics. Never thought I'd see the day, but I thought it would be the most fun to sculpt. Listen to me, <laughs> 2020's really gotten to me. The thing that I learned, the difference between this eye and this eye is this one, I just sculpted directly onto my life cast. I put a lot of Vaseline down first on it and then I sculpted directly on it and then I had a absolute nightmare of a time playing Operation, trying to scrape it off without destroying it, which is why it's super bubbly around the outside and this one's not as bad. And this one, which is the way that you should do it if you wanna do it, is I put three pretty thick layers of latex all over this side of my life cast prior to sculpting anything on it. That is crucial because then rather than scraping scar wax, which is super sticky off of your life cast, you get to basically just peel the latex off the life cast. You still have to be careful, but it's not nearly as bad. I used polymorph plastic to make the teeth, which just like in the last video where I make that mask, you can mold these little pellets of plastic in boiling water. And then once they cool, they are more opaque, not completely, but more opaque. And then because scar wax is so sticky, you can just shove them right in there. 
And then once I had the teeth in, I powdered it. Then I very carefully peeled it off. Then I painted the areas that I knew would be a little harder to paint when I couldn't see so well, basically just the inside of the mouth and the nostrils. I waited to paint the skin until it was on me so I could blend it with the rest of my face. And here we are. Another positive I can say about this movie is that the first Dutch tilt didn't happen until halfway through the movie. Also a big improvement from my very, 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 very low bar. I swear this is why I hate Scarlet. There's like no way to make it look smooth on my face, but it's easy on a life cast because my face indents when I'm trying to... Two hours later. Hello, it's been some time. I decided that I had to finish blending this without talking because it was messing up the blending before I could just get it done. Back to the nightmare that is my life. Where were we? Oh, there's this really fun part where they explain a huge chunk of backstory about Munchausen syndrome in the middle of the film to literally bridge the gap between the premise of the film and where it's coming from in no other more creative way. They just talk at you for like a solid two minutes of script. And that's the only way we get to go to the next part. They just like explain, oh, this is totally where it came from. Totally. It sucks. I don't know if that's gonna be a great critique if you haven't seen the movie, but there you go, I said it. So for whatever reason, the third death we see is the death that finally connects this curse to our main character. Again, we don't really know the rules. For some reason, the main character's death is coming a day later, and for others, it was a few days, it was a weekend, it was a week. And now, the race is on to figure out how this happened and how to stop it. Along with the detective who for some reason has been talking to this main character the whole time to help figure it out and we're not really sure why other than to eventually form a love connection and move the story along in a completely unnatural way. I'm feisty, I'm worked up. I haven't had a sip of this for a while. Ugh, latex time. Like, I don't understand how this main character got involved with the detective anyway. It's not standard procedure to just team up with a non-detective, non-cop, just girl who knew a girl. Like, this is not a standard interview. He didn't take her down to the station. Speaking of not protocol, there's also a scene where she walks up to a doctor to get more information about this woman that she's not related to and the child that she's not related to. And the doctor's just like, oh yeah, I know this and this and this, but this and this and this. And then she gets more of the puzzle and then she can move on to the next scene. But like, a doctor would never. It's so unrealistic and unbelievable. And like, granted, I can forgive that quite a bit to a degree and maybe just a couple Times. But that happens a lot in the movie. But around this time, we see lots of hallucinations and I like the imagery. I think it's creepy. It would have spooked me as a kid. So I do think that there's definitely watch value to this, but watch it for the creepy imagery. Don't watch it for the story. And if creepy imagery is really what you want, there are a lot of better places to start in terms of American remakes of Japanese horror or just going straight to Japanese horror itself. They certainly know how to do it and they do it right. Sorry if I seem pissed, but I'm trying really hard not to emote too much because it'll mess up everything I've been slaving over since 8 p.m. I tried to make this as smooth as I could, but honestly, I don't, I don't know. We tried. At 59 minutes in, there is a very impressive Dutch tilt that goes from this angle to this angle. And honestly, it's kind of cool, but it's completely unmotivated. It's just her walking up the stairs and going down a hallway. But you know what? If you're gonna do a Dutch tilt, maybe make it interesting. I'll give them a little pat on the back for that. At this point, she's in the hospital that had burned down. And we're in the third act and we're gonna find out how to fix this thing. The production design is actually very pretty in a lot of ways. The hospital in that set location is super cool and I would love to live there. But some things are inconsistent. The furniture on the lower level for some reason is not burnt even though the walls are completely fried to a crisp. On the second level, however, it's good. It's consistent, the furniture is all fluffed up. It makes sense. So there's two twists in the movie too. One is one that I'm, I think it's supposed to be a twist. They kind of set it up like, oh my God, check this out. And it's that the main character was abused as a child. And I'm kind of surprised it's presented like a twist because I feel like it's very heavy handed in hinting to that early in the film in a way that I, I thought it was actually supposed to be kind of like a subtle storytelling, the way that you would prefer over very expository storytelling. But no, 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 no. They just ruin it by being like, guess what? She was abused too as a kid. The curse is stemming from what we think is a mother abusing her child for the record. The mother that she's been tracking down. She had two daughters, one died of an asthma attack and the other was still alive, mute, after the fire in the hospital. They had never found the mother, which our main character realizes is because she's in the hospital still. Her body is still there. And this is where I get really confused because she runs into the mother in a vent and I swear to God, I think they're trying to imply that that's not a ghost or a hallucination. I think they're trying to imply that she's barely hanging on 
come to life and this woman found her in the nick of time. Hold that thought, let me do some more work and we'll jump back into it. All right, now that that's dry, we powder. All right, she's really, she's gotten real beat up in the process, but she's still in some kind of shape. And now we will paint and speckle and hope that that kind of camouflages the unevenness of what's going on on my face here. It's starting to look cute though. Now finally, we are at my favorite part of this film, the moment where I had flashbacks. She's in the hospital, she's seeing hallucinations, which happens before you're about to die. She walks up to a crib. I'm gonna try really hard not to emote too much for this because I really don't wanna ruin all this work, but she finds a demon CGI baby in the crib. It has a cell phone in its <laughs> it has a cell phone in its hands, and it turns around menacingly and goes and smiles evilly, but I, I can't do it. I felt like I was watching the movie which we do not speak of all over again. But this one was CGI, not a practical one that just holds on and then teleports. I have so many questions and at the same time I want no answers, so. <sighs> so anyway, she comes in contact with the mother that she's been trying to track down in the vent. It's very good practical effects makeup, it's pretty cool. Clearly she's been like burnt head to toe, doesn't even look recognizable. And then there's this very weird Alexa play careless whisper moment because they come face to face horizontally in this vent and they look like they're about to make out like I think that it was supposed to look like the mother was about to maybe like eat her face like <sighs> oh that looked really creepy with my teeth <sighs> Ooh, but instead it's not like this intimidating I'm on top of you and you're about to die in three seconds they just look like they're about to make out just like the kids in the back row of this movie who are the only people that are actually enjoying it it's very strange and instead of that it just dies on top of her because I guess it's not a ghost I guess it's a real human that has been alive downstairs in the basement of a burnt hospital in a vent with third degree burns over 99.9% .9 of its body for however long this timeline has existed anyway let's do some speckling whoa that is incredible that's amazing. Thanks, it's getting there. You must be able to sniff things really well. And taste things really well. Yeah. Time to make a mess. Pretty sure the character is like blue in the actual film, but I'm just gonna try to make it Mikey colored. Oh, what the hell happened there? It's fine, don't worry, we'll fix it. Then after this lady ghost tries to make out with her and dies, the main character literally says she doesn't know why she's alive, but she thinks maybe that she was sent there to protect her for some reason, based off of, you know, nothing. And then it turns out we get our second twist of the movie, which is, the other daughter that this woman had, the one that died of an asthma attack, is apparently actually the one abusing the second daughter that's still alive. It wasn't Munchausen syndrome by proxy by the mother, it was her sibling, her sister, that was abusing her. She's wearing a black hoodie with her hood up. The character name is Elliot. Wow, she got real freckly real fast, didn't she? Well, we'll fix it, don't worry, we'll fix it. It's a process. You can't rush it either. Oh, I'm speckling the inside of my freaking eyes though, that's a problem. I didn't think this through. And now because we know that it's actually the little daughter, Ellie, who's the real threat here, the detective goes careening back to Beth, our main girl's house. And he's like, Beth, it was never the mother. But it's too late. Our main character gets a second voicemail of her impending death, but she doesn't know it because it's already locked in evidence. And apparently, despite everyone knowing what's been going on in this town, no one warns her. The cops don't warn her, but luckily, Prince Charming, the detective does. There's a big showdown, final boss style, terrible CGI, not scary at all. Even though there is a lot of good imagery in this movie, I think this is certainly not one of them, but you can't win them all. And then the mother comes out behind Ellie, gives her a nice little shoulder massage, and she flies back in her phone, like uh, Jumanji style, actually. It's great because the movie's done. Well, we see someone's phone is ringing with a voicemail or something at the end, you know, one of those cliffhangers that totally no one saw coming. You're setting up the sequel. Setting up the sequel, that's right. Also, the last voicemail that she gets, her second warning of death doesn't make sense because it ends up stabbing her little detective boyfriend in the eye. But like, if there's no free will and things are kind of set in stone, wouldn't the ghost know that? Why did Ellie send her her boyfriend's death and not hers? Could Ellie not predict that it was gonna go that way? Did fate change? Because if fate can change, then why can't any of the characters change their fate? It don't make a whole lot of sense. But honestly, I am surprised that this is the movie that is the lowest rated on Rotten Tomatoes. And let me tell you why. My expectations were low, we know this. So I'm certainly viewing it from the lens of being pleasantly surprised to some degree. Make no mistake, it's a bad movie, but I truly believe and feel like a lot of horror movies released in America in this time were equally as bad. There are a lot of movies that didn't make a lot of sense plot-wise, where the acting is questionable, but that have pretty good scares or are creepy in some way. So I wish I understood why this is the lowest and why we don't see a few others like this down on the list with it. Whoever made this or produced it or wrote it or directed it must have pissed some critics off in Hollywood. That's my guess. 
Hold the phone. I'm gonna clean this up, but I don't wanna keep you on call waiting. Let's go to the montage. This looks better from a little further back. My edges are starting to crack. From all the fun I'm having, not bad considering. Less bad than the film. See, like, I feel like this is a pretty cool look. It's cool that it exists in this movie. The design's fun. This is not as bad as I was expecting. For a 0% rating, I feel like there are enough redeeming qualities that it could have had like a 1%. If you are 10 to 13 years old and you have a crush on someone that you want to hold hands with and not really pay attention to the movie because you're too nervous to really focus, but you need to act like you're paying attention because you don't want to make it seem like all your thoughts are on that other person and your palms are sweating and stuff. You're trying to play a real cool, but it's really, really hard. So you're just, you need a scary movie to pretend that you're scared and you can cuddle up to them and not pay attention at all because your brain's just right here. It's not there. If that is you and that is what you're looking for, this is the perfect movie for you. 10 out of 10, 100%. If you're anybody else, I don't know if you're going to enjoy this. You might like it just for the creepy imagery. It's a great learning device and it is just so much better than that which we don't speak of. So all in all, I had a great time. I'm quite happy about it. Yeah, the story doesn't make sense. Yeah, it's got a lot of problems, but most movies, do no, no, they're not usually this bad. It's bad, it is, but it could have been way worse. And when you're at zero, there's nowhere to go but up. And I think this deserves one extra percent. Let me be the first critic, unofficially, to say it's worth seeing. Take that. Maybe not, it's not really great. It's kind of a waste of three bucks. Watch The Ring or The Grudge instead. Or rather, watch Ringu, the original. And you know what, at the end of the day, who's really laughing? Because the people that made this movie still made 26 million dull hairs. So, it's just something to think about. If you like this video and you wanna see more movie reviews, please hit the subscribe button and the like button. Leave a comment of your least favorite horror movie ever and maybe I will review it in a future video. But I also wanna start reviewing movies that I really love because like I said in the first one, a lot of my favorite movies have a lot of problems with them. The perfect movie doesn't really exist, except for The Village, obviously. Just kidding. You can actually just leave me suggestions of any horror movie you'd like to see me review because I can pick apart anything. Kind of a secret talent I have. That's basically what going to film school is good for, being able to destroy any movie, even the ones you love. Love to do more. And I know what some of you are thinking. The video is coming. It is, I, I don't know when. It's gonna be ready when it's ready, but it is coming. I'm sorry for making you wait. Okay, that's all. See you next week. Doorbell. <laughs> you think that's a real dog? All right, it's not a real dog. She knows that, but she thinks this is a real doorbell, I think.